All right. I'm Kathy Obradovich, opinion editor of the Des Moines Register, and we are here with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, a Democratic candidate for president. Welcome, Senator. Oh. Thanks for being with us. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. We also uh, have uh, members of the Register Editorial Board and other Register reporters and editors, and I'd like to just briefly go around the room so people can introduce themselves, starting with Carol. Carol Hunter, Executive Editor. Rock Slayer, Editorial Board Member. Anne Fonnen, Chief Politics Reporter. Anna Ashbrenner, 2020 Editor for USA Today. Stephen Gruber Muller, State House and Politics Reporter. Barbara Rodriguez, State House and Politics Reporter. Rachel Stassenberger, Politics Editor of Register. Lynn Ta, Caucus Reporter. Richard Doak, Editorial Board Member. Andy Dominic, Editorial Writer. Okay, so uh, let's just start off with uh, a little bit of your background for people who may not know you. Uh, give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself. I grew up in upstate New York uh, and I got my interest in politics from my grandmother. My grandmother was a secretary in our state legislature and worked there her whole life. And of course, 75 years ago, very few women had any power in politics. And so if she wanted to be heard, uh, she figured out the best way to do that was organize all the women in Albany. So she founded the Women's Democratic Club. And over 50 years, these women worked on campaigns and they became powerful. In fact, you couldn't get elected in Albany without the blessing of my grandmother and her lady friends. So I grew up watching her get involved in a lot of campaigns. And I helped her as a kid and really loved it. Um, I knew that what you do with your time matters, and I knew that grassroots activism matters, and I knew that women's voices mattered. And so I always aspired to public service. Uh, I just didn't know how and I didn't know when. And when I first ran for Congress, it was in 2005 um, for a, a congressional seat in my home district, which is two to one Republican. And when I decided to run, the only person who thought I could win was my mother. Uh, but we proved everybody wrong, and I did win. Um, I campaigned around the district on issues of Medicare for All. Uh, it was a huge issue in 2005, 2006. People didn't have access to health care because insurers weren't required to cover you if you had a pre-existing condition. So I thought a buy-in at Medicare would make sense. I also ran on getting our troops out of Iraq, which was the number one issue for my uh, grassroots activists in upstate New York in 2006. And I won. I ran for re-election, and I won again. That time I won by a 24-point margin. Uh, I then um, was appointed to the US Senate in 2009 when Hillary Clinton became the Secretary uh, of State. And I've run three elections since, in 2010, 12, and, and, eight, and six, 18. And in all those elections, I not only won my old 10-county district, but I won it even a higher margin. And my highest vote threshold was 72%. That was higher than anyone's ever achieved, higher than President Obama ever got in New York, higher than Hillary, higher than any person who's ever run for Senate or governor. And uh, beyond electoral victory, I also get a lot of legislation done. Um, even in the last Congress, President Trump signed uh, 18 of my bills. I don't think he knows he did, but he did. Um, I passed big bills in my career, uh, such as Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal and the 9-11 health bill, but also lots of small bills, common sense things that are bipartisan, like money for rural broadband, money for small businesses. And in my last election in 2018, I actually won back uh, 18 counties that President Trump had won. So I know I can win red and blue and purple at the same time. What makes you want to be president? I feel like this moment we're in is um, so important. I think that uh, this country is suffering. Uh, President Trump has really divided us on every racial line, every religious line, every socioeconomic line. He's created fear, he's created division, he's created hatred. Uh, and I think all of us are called, uh, in some respects, to do what we can to restore what's been lost in this country. And I think we need a president who's brave. I think we need a president who's willing to take on the fights that no one else is. And that's who I've been my whole career. Uh, I've stood up to the Pentagon uh, twice, first over Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then over sexual violence in the military. I've stood up to Congress many times as a freshman House member, posting my earmarks and my schedule, my financial disclosure, and then my taxes. The first presidential candidate in this cycle to post all her taxes for public service. Uh, I've passed laws to stop the insider trading by members of Congress to really get at the core of the culture of corruption. 
And I've stood up to the banks, even as a member of Congress from New York, uh, during the financial collapse, when both parties were throwing billions at the banks, I actually read the bill and I saw pretty quickly that it was intended to leave the taxpayers holding the bag. So I've taken on fights that other people won't. And uh, I not only take on those fights, but I actually get things done. And I think we need a president who's brave enough to take on the special interests, to take on the greed and corruption in Washington. It's why my first piece of legislation I introduced as a presidential candidate was publicly funded elections, to actually get the money out of politics, to change who has a seat at the table. Uh, it's why I've worked on getting more diverse candidates to run for office and then helping them win. And I think you need to shake up who's in charge in Washington in order to deliver any of the things that this country needs. Uh, those include health care as a right, not a privilege, passing a Green New Deal, taking on the NRA and gun violence, uh, making sure we have better public schools, debt-free college, and a whole plan to reward work so that more people can earn their way into the middle class. Uh, we'll get uh, delve into those priorities in a second, but uh, last weekend uh, we just heard a large range of Democratic candidates for president, and you were there in yeah. Cedar Rapids for the Hall of Fame dinner. What makes you more qualified than uh, the enormous pack uh, of people who also think they have great ideas and mm -hmm. want to be president? I'm very grateful. We have so many amazing candidates running for president, and I think the diversity of our party is inspiring. Uh, but I have a story that is very different than most candidates that are running. Not only do I win the red places in my state and the purple places and the blue places better than anyone else who's ever run, but I also get things done, and I do things on a bipartisan basis. There's not a Republican in the Senate that I haven't worked with and found some common ground. And as I said, I think what President Trump's done is really divide the country. So we're going to need a leader who will bring us back together and who will actually restore the moral integrity, restore the moral compass of our, of our country, of our leadership, our, our, our moral clarity on the world stage, uh, but also find the common ground in all places of this country, the red places, the blue places, and the purple places, to actually get things done. And I can take any one of those big ideas that I just mentioned and tell you how we will get it done, what parts are bipartisan, how we bring people together, and how we actually start helping people. If we're not p helping people, we should all go home. And I have a track record, unlike anyone else, in actually doing that on a bipartisan basis and still winning electorally. You well, talked a couple of times about the division. Mm -hmm. Which you describe, which you attribute to the president causing the division. But if the division already existed and this president hasn't helped to heal that, right. how would you be different in that mm -hmm. respect? So I think what President Trump has done is poured fuel on a fire that was already burning. President Trump didn't create racism or anti-Semitism or homophobia, uh, but he has poured fuel on the fire with how he talks about issues and where he comes down on those issues. So we just celebrated Pride uh, this weekend in Des Moines, and I have put forward a comprehensive approach to help LGBTQ plus Americans. And some of the things he's done are hateful. He's banned members of the military who've been serving valiantly ban them from serving because they're transgender. Uh, that type of hateful um, rhetoric and demonizing people who are willing to die for this country, I think is immoral. Uh, he demonizes kids who want to choose which bathroom that is consistent with their gender identity, and he demonizes them. Um, I have a robust agenda, which I'll describe if you want me to, but includes things like federal IDs to identify if you want to be X gender, you can. Um, making sure transgender troops can continue to serve, passing the Equality Act so there's no discrimination under federal law for housing, employment, and every aspect of life, um, making sure we help and protect kids, making sure we have health care. So it's how he behaves as president that's harmed us. And I will fight for everyone, no matter where they live, no matter who they are, and no matter who they love. And that will be known because I will put forward policies that lift us up and not discriminate, not demonize, and not marginalize, particularly populations who need us. You know, our country, I think, has always been based on Judeo-Christian values 
of caring about one another. I believe this country is best when we treat others the way we want to be treated and when we care about the least among us. And we need a president who um, has a vision for this country that recognizes that as a strength that we can help the vulnerable, we can help those in need, we don't have to shut our borders, we don't have to separate mothers and children at the border to keep safe, you don't have to choose between national security and border security and humanity and, and having a humane approach for asylum seekers. Um, I saw your editorial about wanting more asylum seekers and refugee families here in Iowa to help meet some of the issues in terms of workers and having seen those refugee communities thrive here. The same experience is true in New York. Um, some of our upstate communities, they lose population every year and have half their population in the last hundred years. Where they thrive is when they take in refugee communities, the innovation, the entrepreneurialism, the growth, it, it matters. And so this president just doesn't lead. He's someone who demonizes the vulnerable. He actually punches down. And he wants us to believe he's strong, but in fact he's not. He's a coward. He's somebody who uh, makes us a smaller country. And I would change that on day one. You uh, changed your view on immigration. Um, and not only that, but apologize for your previous position of being tough on illegal immigration. Yeah. Um, you've talked a little bit about where you are today on immigration, but how tough was it to actually, in politics, change your position of where you've been in the past on an issue like that? It wasn't hard at all because the truth is we have a president who would never admit he's wrong. We have a president who has no humility, who would never recognize that if they just listened to the people they represent, if they just heard from other perspectives, that they might decide they're wrong. Our president would never do that. I think we need a president who would have the humility to recognize when they're wrong, who would listen to people who have different perspectives, learn, grow, and then lead from a new position. That is the definition of learning and growing and having wisdom in life. And I would far rather have a president who can admit their mistakes and then lead from that place. That's what I've done for 10 years. Um, I changed my view on both guns and immigration 10 years ago when I was asked to represent the entire state of New York by our governor. And I listened to communities that were different from my home district. I learned and I have been leading on these issues for a decade. So I know I'm right now, and I think we should want leaders who have enough humility to admit when they're wrong. Wasn't there a political price to pay, though, for changing your view? There may have been, but at the end of the day, you do what's right. Uh, and if you're wrong, you're wrong, and you should be smart enough and capable enough to grow, learn, and lead. And that's what I've done, uh, and it matters. Um, and the interesting thing about me, because I've you know, had that experience, I can go into a red or, or purple community that might not share my view on an issue and explain why they too should share the, share the same view as me and why they too should consider changing their view. And I'll just give an example on gun violence. I understand uh, how important the Second Amendment is and hunting rights. Uh, and how rural areas are very different from cities that suffer from grave gun violence. But I would challenge any NRA member as to whether they believe that it's okay for a four-year-old boy to be shot on a park bench in Brooklyn because a stray bullet hit him and ended his life. And I am certain that the vast majority of Americans would say that is not okay. And they would agree with me that you need to stop the gun trafficking where illegal guns are coming into cities like New York City, like Chicago, from other states, that they, we should have universal background checks so people who shouldn't have access to weapons who are either gravely mentally ill with a violent background or a violent criminal conviction or someone who has a restraining order against them because they've been violent towards their spouse. Um, the NRA is against, they're against universal background checks. They're against the Violence Against Women's Act. They're against background checks for people on the terror watch list. So they couldn't be more wrong. And I think the vast majority of Americans share that view. So I can explain to them why my views changed and why I feel very strongly that it's where everyone should be, that we should all care about gun death and gun violence 
and we should make sure guns are not in the hands of criminals or people who shouldn't have them. Seems like one of those issues, though, where people's views are so solidified. I mean, how do you actually move the needle, not only in the public, where I think you're right yeah. that there's a there's a vast agreement on on some of those issues, um, but in Congress, where you have so much entrenchment. I think people's views are changing because advocacy is growing, uh, and it's a it's a sad fact, uh, but. The fact that young people, students from Parkland and around the country are walking out of schools and are marching on Washington and standing up to members of Congress to have young women like Emma Gonzalez call BS on every member of Congress who's lied to her, to have young men stand up to senators and say, I dare you to stop taking NRA money, that's real advocacy and that's changing the country. Uh, and even if it doesn't change a member of Congress's viewpoint, it's definitely changing voters' viewpoints. If nothing else, the parents and the grandparents of every one of those kids who have been marching on Washington, their views may well have changed. And I believe that with the, through advocacy and through the moms movement, uh, my good friend Gabby Giffords, um, I had to go through with her when she nearly lost her life to gun violence, and then work with her and support her in her nationwide advocacy. Uh, which has been very powerful, and it's changed outcomes. Um, the races that she's got involved in, she's actually won Senate races because her, her and her advocates have invested in campaigns to make sure the voices of everyday Americans are being heard that we want an end to gun violence. So I feel like common ground is growing, and so I am not, I, I have hope that with the level of advocacy we have right now in this country, we can begin to shore up the common ground when I, the, gun, the bill I wrote, the anti-trafficking bill, the last time we got a vote on it, it got 58 votes. It was a widely bipartisan bill. So I believe the next time we get a vote on it, I can get to 60. You mentioned investing in campaigns and, and your idea is to have publicly funded yeah. campaigns. Wouldn't that take an avenue away from Gabby, Gabby Giffords and her folks who uh, are working to raise money and to help Senate candidates on issues that they care about? So um, my bill is specific to campaigns and, and who funds them. So for example, if a candidate is willing to have publicly funded elections, every voter, you would have the opportunity to have $200 to spend in every federal election. So they'd be called democracy dollars, and they would go to every voter in the country for every federal race. So $200 for the presidential race, $200 for the Senate race, and $200 for your House race. And then you could invest your $200, 100 in the primary, 100 in the general, based on who shared your values, but you could only invest it with candidates who agreed for publicly funded elections. And so my bill goes directly towards um, the special interests that spe spend lots of money through super PACs, through PACs, and through federal lobbyist money. It unseats that particular chokehold over members of Congress. Uh, if you do that, you can eventually change the players list, and then you can hopefully get rid of all the money in politics. So you'd have to do it in step by step. Um, I want to make sure we get rid of Citizens United. I think it's outrageous that a special interest can spend unlimited money on campaigns with no disclosure for who they are and who funded those ads. Um, and I believe in ethics reform across the board. I think the Supreme Court shouldn't be able to be wined and dined by lobbyists and special interests, which they are today. I would have a federal law requiring that. And I would support uh, an investment in voting rights, making sure we make election day a day off, making sure we uh, have early voting in every state, vote by mail in every state, uh, and actually fund some of the work state by state to make sure at least that there's a paper receipt from every vote, because if you don't have that, if Russia decides to try hack us again, you won't be able to actually do a full recount if necessary. Uh, and do you think that candidates uh, specifically for president, but also these high dollar Senate races would actually agree to uh, go with publicly funded elections? Doesn't that go with spending limits? We've, in the last few presidential races. My bill doesn't go with spending limits. It goes with where the money comes from. Okay. So instead of the moneyed interests, the very successful and powerful uh, corporate interests, the lobbyists who are paid millions of dollars to lobby, they are the ones who don't have a seat at the table. 
whereas every voter does. So instead of candidates just going to, you know, ballroom dinners and fancy living rooms to ask for money, they're going to start going to the senior center. They'll be going to the community center. They'll be going to the public housing. They'd be asking people not just for their vote, but for, for support to actually fund their campaigns. So it just changes who members of Congress are talking to. The third part of my Fixed Democracy First agenda is also going to be about incentivizing candidates and campaigns to be um, much more beholden to their voters than to the lobbyists and the special interests they see in Washington every day. So encouraging them to get back home to do their town halls, to have office hours, uh, to maybe post the substance of a, of a vote at least a week in advance so people can comment on it, posting their schedules so that uh, people could know who they're meeting with, which special interests are getting your time. That's the kind of uh, transparency and accountability that could begin to restore um, people's voice in our democracy. So the voter gets $200 to spend on a candidate. Mm -hmm. They can't put any of their own money into the race? You just addition? get it. No, because the maximum you can receive is $200 from anyone. Right. And so it changes who has power. They implemented a sim. that comes from? person's own checkbook or from no you would you would not take you would not spend your own money um, so what's I mean why shouldn't a person say like your grandmother yeah if, if she had say a thousand dollars to spend and she thought you were the greatest candidate in yeah. America why couldn't she give you a thousand dollars so I don't believe that money is speech and I don't believe that corporations have the same free speech rights as individuals I'm talking about an individual here. right but I don't think money is speech right. And the reason why is today, and I don't know if this is an accurate number from the last election, but I think it's pretty close. Only about less than 1% of all Americans give money in political campaigns. That means you have a very small sliver of Americans who are, are really funneling money and having an outsized influence on what campaigns are run on, what they talk about, what issues are raised. And in Seattle, where they put this publicly funded elections idea into practice, it changed everything. Uh, before this was implemented for local elections, only 25% of donations in the campaigns were low dollar. After they implemented this, 75% of donations in campaigns were low dollar. Also, the nature of people changed. It used to be largely white male affluent donors. And under Seattle's reform, women participated communities of color participated, and low-income communities participated. So you're just, again, democratizing our democracy and changing who is being asked, oh, sorry, who's being asked to support campaigns. Uh, and it's changing who has a, a voice. And I think that's the quickest thing we can do to get to money out of politics and to getting who has a seat at the table in Washington. How do you get rid of citizens? So you need a new Congress. You, you need people who don't believe money is speech and that uh, free speech rights are money. So you'd, you, have to, you'd have to have a constitutional correct. amendment. Correct. You'd have to have a constitutional amendment, which would take you to Congresses. It takes a long time to get it done. Um, and in the meantime, um, I would also address the problem of the politic um, politicization of the Supreme Court and our judiciary. I think one of the worst things President Trump is really um, start to politicize our courts um, by attacking judges he doesn't like, uh, by using the bully pulpit to demean the judiciary, as well as the Department of Justice, but to demean the judiciary, and then to so politicize, uh, with the help of Mitch McConnell, the Supreme Court justice choices. The fact that Mitch McConnell stole Merrick Garland from President Obama and said, no, not the year before a presidential election. He just said at an event that if it was the last year of President Trump's presidency that, of course, he'd fill that seat. So he has disproportionately politicized our Supreme Court. And then choosing two ju justices with uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, who are so ultra-conservative and so far outside the mainstream uh, that uh, we now have a very imbalanced court. So as president, I would have a commission to study how do you depoliticize the court. And I would look at ideas like, should we have a larger number on the Supreme Court? I would look at the idea of whether we should have term limits on the Supreme Court. Um, I would have them study it and have the smartest nonpartisan group of people to say, what, what, what is the best way to change what really President Trump has really metastasized 
this over politicization is very harmful because we're supposed to have three co-equal branches of government that and are we, independent we, of each other. And we know that uh, the president was confident in his two picks that they were going to yeah. be opposed to um, yeah, that they upholding would, Roe versus correct. Wade. Correct. So if you're president and you get to, to nominate somebody to the court, are you going to ask that nominee, your nominee, to vote a certain way on Roe So I Wade? will only appoint judges and justices that see Roe v. Wade as settled precedent, uh, because it is. It is law of the land, and it has been for over 30 years. And the truth is, um, to me, women's reproductive freedom should not be an ideologic or a uh, political issue. I think it's an issue of basic human rights because what you're telling women by criminalizing abortion and criminalizing the doctors that provide care is that they have no basic human rights to decide their bodily autonomy, to decide uh, whether they will put their life at risk. We have the highest maternal mortality rate of any <coughs> industrialized country in the world. And if you are a black woman, you are four times more likely to die in childbirth. So when you take away a woman's agency to decide when she's having children, how many she's having, and under what circumstances, you are literally denying her the basic human and civil right to decide whether she lives or dies. And to not allow any, um, any uh, uh, exceptions for life of the mother, for well-being and health of the mother, for um, the circumstances under which you're, you became pregnant for rape and incest, it's, out, it's, out, it's beyond. It's, it's outrageous and it should not be um, allowed. And I really fear that both Justice Kavanaugh and um, Gorsuch were not honest when they were asked, do you see this as settled precedent, when they both said yes. Um, so we'll see. But I'm very concerned that President Trump has upended something that the United States and the law of the land has been in place for, gen for now two generations. Uh, and I think it's, it's wrong to deny women basic reproductive freedom and basic human rights. You've said you're worried about judicial independence, but imposing a litmus test on your nominees yeah. has long been seen as right. uh, an encroachment on judicial independence. Right. Um, I mean, are, are you doing... I think there's you're... some issues that are, have such moral clarity that we have as a society decided that the other side is not acceptable. Imagine saying um, that it's okay to appoint a judge who's racist or anti-Semitic or homophobic. Um, telling, uh, uh, asking someone to appoint someone who takes away basic human rights of any group of people in America. I, I think that we are, we've, we've I don't think those are political issues anymore. And we believe in this country in the separation of church and state. And I respect the rights of, of every American to hold their religious beliefs true to themselves. But our country and our constitution has always demanded that we have a separation of church and state. And all these efforts by President Trump and other ultra-radical conservative judges and justices to impose their faith on Americans is contrary to our Constitution, and that, that's what this is. And so I believe that for all of these issues, um, they are not issues that there is a fair other side. There is no moral equivalency when you come to racism. And I do not believe there's a moral equivalency when it comes to changing laws that deny women reproductive freedom. You mentioned uh, Senator McConnell uh, and uh, he and Senator Grassley have been very, very effective at getting conservative judges on the court, um, at blocking the last president's um, uh, picks. How can you reverse that without playing the same game that they did? In other words, reverse uh, the conservative nature of the court? Yeah, I mean, without, so. I, do you... Um... Well, that's why I would have a commission to study it, because I think he's politicized the court. Uh, and the fact that Mitch McConnell says he'll appoint a judge in the last year, he's certainly politicized the court. And so I think that is harming our constitutional democracy. And so that's why I would have an independent commission study it, make recommendations for Congress to debate, and for us to actually look at possible solutions. The only two that I've heard of, even raised by through the grassroots, is change the number of justices or term limits, but there may be other ideas. 
I, I would certainly be open to a commission studying them both to see are these legitimate answers, are there unintended consequences, are these things that would actually do the thing you want them to do, which is depoliticize the court. So I'd, I'd like experts to study it because I don't know for sure, so I'd like to know from people who would know. You've uh, supported Medicare for All, um, and s I, I believe, if, if I'm characterizing this correctly, say it's a goal to eventually end private insurance. It wasn't. It's not something that you think should be done right away. Is that correct? On, um, am I? Yeah. Okay. So, do you want me to? Go yeah. Well, I just. Uh, so I'm just. I guess my question is, um, how, why why can't private insurance coexist with a government option, um, why, why should it be a goal to eventually fa phase out private insurance? So this is what I believe. Um, I believe that health care is a right and not a privilege. And so if you truly believe it's a right and not a commodity, something that you need to be able to afford to buy, then you have to get us to a single payer system uh, or not-for-profit system that uh, allows for universal coverage that's affordable. And so I think the quickest way to get there is to allow people to buy into Medicare at a price they can afford. Um, and I wrote the transition part of Senator Sanders' bill. I helped to write that part. And I think if you allow the American people to have four or five years where they get to choose, if you want a not-for-profit public option, Medicare is available to you at 4% of your income, matched by your employer, 4% of, of, of income. Uh, you will create opportunity for people to have better coverage for less, uh, for less money. And 4% of income for most Americans, I mean 90 plus percent of Americans earn less than $100,000. So that means 90 plus of Americans are going to have coverage at $4,000 or less a year. That is more affordable than most people are paying. If you are a low wage worker and only earn you know, $20,000, let's say you earn $20,000, that means you're going to be able to buy it at $800 a year. That's affordable. Um, you'd have Medicaid continue to expand, but if people are buying it at a price they can afford, what you'll have is funds going straight into healthcare, straight into our hospital network, straight into our community health centers, straight into our doctor's offices. You exclude the middleman, uh, which is an insurance company that actually has to take quarterly profits and they have to guarantee CEO pay and shareholder value. All of that for-profit um, interest is just money out of healthcare to, to fund a whole other industry. So if you create this opportunity for a buy-in, private insurers can compete. I dare them to compete. I don't know that they will because they don't lower their prices. They raise their prices every year. I don't know that they will compete successfully and they may well be disrupted. The market will tell. And then once you convert most of Americans into the, this new Medicare for All because they've chosen it, um, you could then have a very short step to making healthcare be an earned benefit. My vision for healthcare is to actually make it just like Social Security, where everyone buys it at 4%, matched by their employer at 4%, and that becomes um, Medicare for All, and it's there for everyone. And to the extent you want to have an insurance plan to cover non-medically necessary procedures such as plastic surgery or a facelift or you know, Botox or whatever you might want, the insurance industry will figure out whether there's a product out there they can offer to make money. And there's no reason why that can't happen as long as you have universal coverage that's affordable. The two worries I hear most often about Medicare for All, um, one is uh, retired people are worried that their med Medicare that they have been anticipating, or people who are about to retire, their med Medicare is going to change, um, that somehow their, their cost or their access um, will change as a right. result of everybody in the world being part of this program now. The second thing I hear is from rural docs and rural hospitals that say, um, Medicare doesn't pay enough, enough to yes. ensure access, especially in rural areas. So I would address both concerns in this way. Uh, the first thing I would do, and we've already put this into law, we need transparency in pricing. Right now, and these aren't real numbers, I'm just using them as, as placeholders, it might be Medicaid reimburses $50 for an x-ray. It might be that Medicare reimburses $100 for an x-ray, but the person off the street has to pay $5,000 for the x-ray. The x-ray probably doesn't cost any of those numbers. So we need transparency in pricing. We need to know how much does the x-ray actually cost the hospital. Let's just say maybe it's $250. Well, maybe that 
that is the, once we set what the real cost is, that has to be the Medicare reimbursement rate. So then a rural hospital, for example, knows their costs are going to be covered. Because if you ask any hospital in America, you will only be allowed Medicare patients under this plan, they'll say, then we'll go out of business because we won't be able to cover costs. So it must reflect costs. That's change one. Change two, you must go after the drug companies. Uh, when Medicare Part D was written into law, again, probably by a lobbyist in the dead of night or by a lobbyist who convinced a member of Congress because they gave them lots of money, they guaranteed that Medicare could not buy in bulk to get the cheapest price. So unfortunately, now our seniors pay too much for medicine. They're not protected. Prices go up every year. Uh, when I've traveled around the country, one of the biggest worries our seniors have is they just can't afford their medicine. So you must uh, bend the cost curve of health care by taking on the insurance companies and, and not the, taking on the insurance companies to do Medicare for all, but then taking on the drug companies to ensure we get the lowest price for Medicare. Uh, and then I, I would do another thing. If drug companies keep um, raising their prices and price gouge, I have comprehensive legislation to pull their profits back if they are gouging every year and raising their rates too much. But also, um, we should be able to uh, have generics be produced within a certain amount of time. A lot of these drug companies are gaming the system by changing how quickly it gets released or the dosage and these small changes. And it's resulted in really important medicines not having a generic like insulin. I mean, it's an outrage. The inventor of insulin, when he invented it, he said, this is such a great discovery. I'm not even going to patent it because I want the world to have it. The current uh, maker of insulin has kept patent protection on it and will not make a generic. And so the price of insulin, which is needed by millions of Americans, keeps going up. And it's unaffordable, especially for our seniors, because diabetes is, is prevalent among a lot of our seniors. And so I would look to whether we can ask the NIH, if there's a drug that will not be made into a generic, I would ask the NIH to start producing it. Uh, especially if it's a drug that is necessary for human life and, and well-being and is something that needs to be readily available for millions of Americans. And so I might create some not-for-profit competition uh, for drugs that haven't been moved to generic quickly enough. Yeah, I, I skipped the, the third reason that people And another, say. another drug that is relevant is the HIV drugs. PrEP, they've not, they've not made the generic for PrEP even though it's been readily available, I think, for over a decade. And it's outrageous because people with HIV do not have to have ac do not have access to affordable medicine to save their lives, and they're gouging. I I, I listened to a podcast just a couple of days ago, and I think the price they said was typically fourteen thousand dollars a year. If you're a low income person, well, then you can't afford the medicine that keeps you living, and that's morally wrong. And so I would look to see whether we could use the NIH to compete with um, for-profit drug industries that will not create a, a, a generic within a certain amount of time. There are different plans out there on how you pay for um, a universal health care system. Right. What's yours? Mine is people should buy in. I think if you make it an earned benefit, like Social Security, it will be permanent. You will never take it away. Imagine a politician or a president saying, oh yeah, I'm going to take away your Social Security. There'd be revolution. <laughs> it wouldn't happen. So if you really want health care as a right and not a privilege, and you want it to be universal and permanent and high quality, you let people buy in because then it's theirs. And you have them buy in no matter what stage of their career they're on, full time, part time, big companies, small companies, always buying in at 4% of income. Uh, and if you do have the buy in period and you do see large numbers of Americans buying in, if you get to a threshold number, it's such a small step then to say this should be an earned benefit and everyone buys in. And that is a way for the ultra wealthy to really invest in the common good because they're going to be buying into healthcare and not necessarily consuming, let's say you make a million dollars, you're not necessarily going to consume $40,000 of healthcare every year, but you're sure helping the man who earns $20,000 a year and pays in $800 to cover his expenses. So it's one of the best ways to have um, all of uh, all you know individuals in the country paying in to both Social Security and Medicare. I think we need to make Social Security more um, solvent, and so I'm uh, co-sponsoring with a number of senators the bill to blow the cap on Social Security to make sure that incomes over 250 are also taxed at the 6.7 percent. Is that the right? Yeah. 
Uh, so eliminate the cap or eliminate or it. it? Eliminate it. Eliminate it. Um, we, we allowed for donut holes so middle class people don't feel like they're being burdened at a time when we need middle class tax cuts. But ultimately you want to blow the cap. And, and so you want, if you have enough of a buy-in on Medicare, that then you make it an earned benefit for everybody. And it's just like Social Security. It comes straight out of your tax, straight out of your paycheck like we do with Social Security. It's an, and it's a public insurance that you buy into your whole life and that your employer matches. <clears throat> How does mental health figure into your health care plan? And, it has and to be fully covered exactly like any other medical issue. And I know Iowa has such a challenge because you've closed mental health providers. You don't have an adequate number of mental health providers. Uh, in fact, I think Iowa is ranked among the lowest of all states in terms of access to mental health and uh, the number of mental health providers. And you have certain communities that are desperate for more mental health. We need it for our students. Um, I just met with a bunch of teachers and they need access to mental health as well because they're dealing with so many challenges in their classrooms. You need access to mental health for um, our, our veterans. The fact that we have such a high prevalence rate of PTSD and traumatic brain injury and not enough mental health professionals to meet their need is, I think, unacceptable. So through Medicare for All, you would make sure that mental health is fully covered along with your dental, along with vision, so that the whole spectrum of health is part of what universal health care looks like in America. Let's talk a little bit about trade. Um, as you know, Iowa farmers are getting um, pinched uh, by the, the president's uh, trade war. Um, but do you think it's possible that American workers could eventually be better off if uh, President Trump succeeds in getting the new U.S.-Canada-Mexico deal passed, wins concessions from China? Um, I mean, is it possible that if his approach succeeds that people could be better off? And, and how would you do better as president? So I think President Trump has failed to deliver on his campaign promises. He said no bad trade deals. He said, I'm going to bring back the jobs. I'm going to get rid of the trade deficit. In fact, none of those three things have happened. The trade deficit has grown, especially with regard to China, the one he's trying to change. Uh, he's not ended bad trade deals. He's started trade wars, and those are very different. Our trade war with China has hurt our manufacturers and our farmers. In Iowa, I've heard from a lot of your farmers that are really suffering, not just from the floods, which have devastated a lot of farmers' land, and they're unable to plant crops because it keeps flooding. But the fact that corn and ethanol and soybeans and pork are four of their biggest exports, and China is one of their biggest buyers, when you have a trade war, those markets dry up. And so they're not selling the things they're making, and it's really harming them. And our manufacturers have been harmed because the price of steel has gone straight up, skyrocketed. And so for a manufacturer like John Deere, where their number one input is steel, they can't make the tractor and sell it for an affordable price because the input is so expensive. It's harming us. It's harming our producers and our manufacturers. So what I would do differently. I think where President Trump has failed the most is oftentimes we are watching him fight for fight, fighting sake. He's not actually bringing people to the table or getting things done. Um, and in fact, I think we do better when we use multilateralism, when we work with allies, when we work with the world community, when we use the WTO as an effective platform to prosecute China. China does a lot of things wrong. We need to stand up to China when they dump steel on the market. We need to stand up to them when they steal our IP. We need to stand up to them when they manipulate their currency. And if you do it with the benefit of the world community and platforms like the WTO, your power and your leverage is so much greater uh, because you're requiring a standard of behavior to be part of the world community. And he's left all that leverage at the table because he's alienated our allies. He won't uh, he won't value our NATO allies and won't defend our NATO allies. He steps away from global climate accords when he could be using the global climate accords as a way to engage China. Uh, why not, instead of a space race with Russia, when John F. Kennedy said, I want to put a man on the moon in the next 10 years as a measure of our effectiveness and our innovation, why not do the same thing with green energy? Why not 
lead on the world stage and say we are going to be the country that leads on ending global climate change and we're going to use our scientists and our engineers and our mathematicians to solve this greatest threat to humanity that exists. We're actually going to create a nationwide call to action for innovation in wind and solar and geothermal and hydropower and biofuels right here in Iowa. Imagine all the investment we could make to get us to next generation cellulosic ethanol. Imagine cracking the code by investing in science and research. It would help our farmers, it would help our entrepreneurs here in Iowa. We already lead on wind. Why not invest in wind so that we can continue to make it more efficient and more effective? And if he was leading on the world stage, he could engage China on something helpful to the world, like tackling global climate change. Um, and he's refused to do that. So he's just left leverage at the table. He's not used the world community to help him. Uh, and he's very blustery. And so he's constantly fighting, but not actually getting things done. I would do the exact opposite. I wanted to ask you um, about farm policy. You, you sit on the Senate Agriculture Committee. Mm -hmm. um, ag is kind of important in Iowa. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you could craft the perfect farm bill to truly benefit farmers, truly benefit rural economies, what would it look like? So I've been talking to a lot of farmers in Iowa and across the country over the last few months. And some things are, are different than New York, but some are the same. Um, in New York, I have led on dairy. And one of the biggest problems in dairy is that we have the threat of consolidation, which leads to the threat of outsourcing. I think producing our food in America is a national security issue. I don't want the continuation of consolidation of our producers, where small producers are going out of business uh, because of a lot of different issues. Um, but they need more support. So in dairy specifically, um, when dairy really thrived and we didn't have dairy farmers going out of business and committing suicide, it was when we had supply management. It was when we had an insurance um, approach where farmers could continue to produce what they, what, um, dairy producers can continue to produce what they produce, but there would be a, um, a reimbursement of actually how much it costs to produce milk. You'd be shocked to know that the price of milk can be in the last decade the same as it was in the 1970s because they actually don't take into account how much it costs to produce the goods they're producing. They don't take into account fuel. They don't take into account feed. Uh, and in fact, the price of milk is set by the price of cheese in Chicago. It's not correlative. And so I've t begun to talk to some of the commodity producers. And what I've heard from commodity farmers in Iowa, to, to many of them, they said, just let us sell what we produce and give us a fair price for what we produce. They don't want handouts. They just want to farm. And I want them to farm because, again, if you see farming as a national security issue, we want food production in every part of the nation, and we want small farms to be able to thrive as much as large farms because consolidation always creates the risk of outsourcing. If it some, all of a sudden becomes cheaper to farm in Mexico or cheaper to farm in China, I don't want multinational corporations, large multinational corporations to say, yeah, let's just move it. Because as soon as that farmland is sold, it will get developed. And then you cannot restore that farm, you cannot restore ag. So I think ag is vital for the national security of the country. So I'm gonna look on farm policies where people and farmers are paid properly for what they produce, uh, that they are guaranteed the ability to continue to produce, and that we have better insurance programs. Uh, because you've seen, and even President Trump's bailout, I mean, I don't even know if he asked the farmers before he created, did you know one of the provisions in his bailout says that to get the money, you've gotta be actually be able to plant your seed this season? Well, how many Iowan farmers have said, we just got flooded again, there's no way we can plant anything this season because we're still underwater. That just shows the disconnect of a president who doesn't talk to the people that he purports to represent, who doesn't listen, who doesn't change his views when he's wrong, who doesn't grow. 
It is harming us and it's harming our farmers. So as president, I would make sure I have a robust agricultural advisory board like I do in New York State, where I am talking to my farmers in all industries regularly about what they need when it comes to immigration, what they need when it comes to um, production, what they need when it comes to insurance. And that's why I've been uh, very aggressive on ag policy for the, the certainly dairy farmers, the fruits and vegetable farmers, the specialty crops, the organic crops, because that's what we specialize in New York. As president, I will learn a lot about other crops, commodities and ranchers, and make sure that I can make sure that they continue to thrive and don't get displaced or outsourced. So Chuck Grassley has long pushed to have tighter rules on farm subsidies, so it's not an investor in Chicago or... Right a foreigner who's actually collecting those subsidies. Why has that been so hard to try to tighten up? Um, well, I think if, if he's not been able to do what he wanted to do, then I would suggest we need more transparency and accountability. Um, I think one of the worst things about government in Washington is how corrupted it is. I think fundamentally um, companies like Monsanto and other large ag companies can distort ag policy easily because they have so much power. It's one of the reasons why I want to get money out of politics. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I want members of Congress to have to go back to their states and districts more to hear directly from their constituents. And so you really have to fix democracy first to solve that problem. Because I bet if you actually trace it through, you're going to find the, every impediment that he hasn't been able to overcome is because of money in politics. You find me some a, a so-called unsolvable problem, I will find you the corrupt special interest group that's in the way. What do you think is the biggest, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the economy recovering, the economy adding jobs uh, up until May where things sort of stalled out a little bit, um, but it, not necessarily uh, people benefiting equally across the board. Uh, what do you think is the biggest problem with the American economy and how do you go about solving it? I would suggest, um, four or five big problems. Um, and I think we have to start looking at the economy with the principle that we want to start rewarding work again. I think we have not rewarded work in the last several decades for a number of reasons. First, the supremacy of shareholder rights over worker rights. Uh, we have aligned our law, and every business school teaches it, that shareholders get supremacy. First dollar goes to a shareholder, not to a worker. So to protect workers and to reward work, I would do three things. First, I would uh, really support our unions. Uh, we know that if a community has unionized workers, pay is about 25 percent higher. People earn more, they have better benefits, and communities thrive. So really protect the right to collectively bargain, protect the right to organize, uh, protect the right for card check, and really fight against right to work states. I would make that a priority. Second, uh, I believe that there's infrastructure around our economy that is not working for everyone. This is why people feel, feel so uh, deeply left behind and don't have opportunities. So I would do four or five things there. I would have a higher minimum wage, a living wage, uh, one that's $15 indexed to inflation, and I would, I would eliminate the tipped wage. Second, I would have a national paid leave plan, so people who are needing care uh, that is needed in their family, whether an ill or dying spouse, or a dying parent, or a sick child, or a new baby, have a national paid leave, like every other industrialized country in the world. Um, and I would make it an earned benefit that people buy into with just the smallest amount of money, $2 a week. Third, I would have universal pre-K and affordable daycare so more workers can be in the workplace thriving and providing for their families, uh, especially uh, in those early childhood years. And <laughs> equally as important, every dollar you put into early childhood education, you get out somewhere between 11 and $13 in productivity by that young person once they enter their career field because they had access. So it's a huge economic indicator. I would do equal pay for equal work. Um, and uh, do those structural changes. And then third, the biggest problem in Iowa, I believe, uh, and a lot of other places like New Hampshire and Michigan and parts of New York is underemployment. 
Um, we can, you know, declare victory at 4% unemployment, but the truth is real unemployment's higher. It's about 8%. And then the people who have stopped looking for work aren't even counted. And you add to that the people who are underemployed. You ask a lot of Iowans, do you feel like you're earning to your full potential? They're going to say no. The fact that you have a, what, 2.4% unemployment rate, uh, but you have 20% of your population living below the poverty line, there's your disconnect. It means that people are working, but they're not earning enough to actually provide for themselves and their families. And so to address underemployment, I would do one thing. I would guarantee workforce training for anyone who's unemployed or underemployed. I would use our community colleges, our state schools, our apprenticeship programs, and our not-for-profits to provide the training. I would ask them to coordinate with the local employers so that the coursework they're offering is exactly what's needed for the local employer, and I'd fund that as a national priority. To pay for it, I would have a transaction tax. For every time you buy and sell a stock or a bond, pennies on the hundreds of dollars. They already have it in place in the UK. It doesn't harm your markets. If anything, it displaces your flash traders, which I don't think are actually creating value. But that transaction tax alone is worth $77 billion a year. So I would do that to pay for it. And it works. And one example from New York, when Bombardier, one of our big manufacturers in the North Country needed advanced welders, they couldn't find any within 500 miles. So they went to the local community college and said, please offer this advanced welding coursework. We'll hire all your graduates and it's a $70,000 a year job. They've already trained and placed 100 workers through that program. So I'd fund things like that. Overall tax policy, mm -hmm. um, it, we've talked about a lot of things that cost a lot of money. You've mentioned some of them about how you would pay on the way. Mm -hmm. um, would you roll back the uh, 2017 tax cuts? Uh, would you raise taxes on only some people? How would, how would that work? So I believe in middle class tax cuts. And I think what President Trump did in his tax cut was a huge disservice to the economy because most of that $1.5 trillion went to the wealthiest Americans who aren't going to invest that money. They will put it in a bank account for their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. They're not necessarily going to go out and buy more sneakers and help the local economy grow. So that's point one. Uh, point two, the money went to the largest corporations that, again, largely didn't decide to do more research and development or build another plant. In fact, they spent their money doing things like stock buybacks and paying more dividends, which, in, uh, uh, that, which actually goes to the wealthiest individuals. So it's not, again, helping the middle class. The only part of that tax cut I'd keep in place is the middle class parts, which was a very small percentage of it. But we'd keep that. Um, I would deal with intergenerational wealth by actually having a much more robust estate tax that is actually enforced. And I'd make sure that the estate tax works. Um, I would not uh, burden family farms or small businesses with estate tax. Those would be exceptions. What I would do is tax intergenerational wealth um, and certainly tax dodgers that are trying to get around it. Um, and then third, I would uh, really look at our tax code to make sure it's progressive. Um, I would get rid of tax cuts that aren't helpful, like carried interest. It doesn't provide value. It's unnecessary. It's just money going to the wealthiest individuals. And I would try to do a wholesale review to find good middle class tax cuts uh, and make sure that everyone pays their fair share. Anybody else? Have questions I'd, here? I'd like to circle back, because you, you spoke eloquently about uh, why you changed your position about a decade ago on on guns and uh, immigration. Uh, does that mean you don't think Joe Biden should be criticized for his recent change on the Hyde Amendment? He was wrong in his position, and I'm glad that he listened. You said yesterday, I don't think there's room in our party for a Democratic candidate who does not support women's full reproductive freedom that was seen widely as going after Biden on the Hyde Amendment. Do you think there is room for someone like Biden who a week ago did, still supported the Hyde Amendment? No, he supports the Hyde Amendment, and that's where our, our candidates need to be. Um, I would, and I have opposed candidates in primaries that don't support reproductive freedom. In fact, I just did an endorsement um, in one of the suburbs uh, of Chicago in Illinois uh, to support Marie Newman over the incumbent who is anti-choice. I, I just, I don't think it's appropriate for Democrats who 
claim we are the party of women to impose religious views on other people. I just don't think it's appropriate. Um, we believe in the separation of church and state, and that is a requirement of our constitutional democracy. So I just don't support candidates that do not see my reproductive freedom as a civil human right and want to tell me, which we have legislatures all over this country, look at what's happening in Alabama, look at what's happening in Missouri, uh, in Georgia, uh, that are criminalizing these reproductive choices, these decisions, life and death decisions that women have to make for themselves because it's their life that's at risk, uh, that they have a right to make and has been law of the land. And I just don't think on Hyde specifically, why would you punish low-income women? Why would you say all women are entitled to this choice unless you don't have any money, unless you're too poor to afford services and you are a Medicaid and a, or a Medicare patient? So, so I just don't support candidates that don't see women's reproductive freedom as a civil, constitutional, human right that it is. So does that mean if Biden wins the nomination, you couldn't support him, given his history on the Hyde Amendment? No, he's already changed his view. He's running as a candidate who is pro-choice. I would have a problem if our colleagues weren't running as pro-choice candidates, which is one of the reasons why I'm running for president. Because the truth is, I've led on this issue for over a decade. I've led on women's rights. I've led on LGBTQ plus equality. I've led on civil rights. Like, this is what I do. I take on the fights that other Democrats don't. I take on the hard conversations that other people don't want to have. As a freshman senator, I passed the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the first major piece of gay rights legislation in the decade I've been serving. Like, no one else had done it. No one else had even tried. But I began to like find my allies. I had to convince Democrats. I had to look Democrats who said, Kirsten, why are you doing this? It's so inconvenient. And I had to look them in the eye and say, when is civil rights ever convenient? You need to be for this for the right reason. So I had to push my party. And once I pushed my party, I could go to Susan Collins and say, let's find our Republican allies. And we found the seven Republicans we needed to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It takes leadership. And I believe I'm the only candidate who will do the right thing for the right reason, who will go through fire to do what's right, and who will take on these battles that other people don't have the courage to take on, that they aren't brave enough to take on. And I believe we deserve a president who's brave. And that's why I'm running for president. We only have about one minute left, and we've got, uh, I'm sure, a million other questions and issues that we want to talk about. But I want to give you an opportunity to wrap up. If you want to bring up an issue that we haven't, you haven't had a chance to talk about uh, just because you haven't been asked. Um, but just uh, give us your give us your final pitch. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you all for having me in, and uh, I really appreciate this process. Um, I do believe we are at a time where President Trump has degraded our country, degraded our democracy, and each one of us has to do whatever we can to restore what's been lost. Uh, and I have taken on the fights that other people have not taken on. In my career, I've taken on the banks, I've taken on the Department of Defense, uh, the Pentagon itself, I've taken on Congress. Uh, and I will restore our democracy to the hands of the people because I have the courage to stand up to the special interests and to get money out of politics. But I will support every person in this country. I will fight for every family as if they were my own. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you live or who you love. I will have your back. I will fight for you. And I have the courage to do it. And that's why I believe I'm the best candidate to be president of the United States. All right. Thank you very much, Senator, for being here. Thanks to all of you for watching. Please come back to